Дорогие друзья. Dear friends, good morning. Uh, time to begin the forum of uh, United Cultures in St. Petersburg is opening. Here we are in the general staff building of the Hermitage Museum. I hope everyone can hear interpreters, right? You can hear, right? You can? Is everything all right? Right, perfect. So our discussion uh, is dedicated uh, to uh, the knowledge of um, uh, a learning of history through culture. We make decisions in our everyday life, in our personal life, on the basis of experience. Is that true? Is that correct? Can we say the same thing about humanity and about nations? This issue, other issues, are to be discussed today at the session, um, which is opening the forum. And uh, allow me to introduce the uh, speakers who will take part in the discussion. Pierre de Gaulle, the president of the Foundation for Peace Between Nations and for Prosperity, president and founder of the Foundation, grandson of General de Gaulle. Monsieur de Gaulle, we're happy to welcome you here. Benot Singh, director of the Institute BRICS, he is from India. Professor Richard Sakwa, Professor of the Department of Political Science and International Relations from the University of Kent, Great Britain. Kamil Almoani Mohammed, founder and chairman of the International Institute for Cultural Diplomacy from the United Arab Emirates. Of, um, uh, uh, Antoni, uh, Antoni, who is the head of the um, Department of Foreign Relations of the Moscow Patriarchy, Matush Alexa, uh, founder of the Motorcyclists uh, Civic Association from Slovakia, brother for brother, Slovakia. Dear colleagues, dear friends, I suggest that we start our discussion and uh, uh, be brief, please, concise. And we will try to discuss quite a number of issues today. And to begin with, allow me to ask all of you one question. Um, in your opinion, from what sources do people mostly uh, get information about the past? From mass media? from science literature, from fiction, from school textbooks, or else from elsewhere. Mr. de Gaulle, the question is to you first. Well, I think that history and culture, that's what um, um, is um, in the basis of the which is the, the, the treasure trove of nations. This is what makes our culture deeper and richer. It's very important to go back to history because history is what our um, ancestors have been fighting for, what they created. This is what is the basis of the states and nations, history repeats itself very often, and there is a lot of lessons in history. And this is what constitutes our shared culture. As my grandfather used to say, it is very important to know one's history. In the basis of victories of Alexander of Macedonia, we always find Aristotle. It's very important to rely on history. Well, of course, the main source uh, for us are classical uh, textbooks. The Internet provides a lot of information as well. Unfortunately, in the Western world, history is very often written. It is politically orientated, and we lose, uh, we lose uh, orientation in, science, in history. And it's very important um, uh, for 
personal development. For it, for it, it's important to go back to the sources in order to be able to render history to our people and uh, to see what um, uh, our nations are based on. It's necessary to go back to classical textbooks. Um, um, uh, Internet is an important instru instrument, but we should be very careful when using the Internet. Um, uh, no, we need to create ourselves to develop ourselves. So this enriches us. Culture does help us, help us to be free in the present-day world. Well, th uh, thank you. I'm addressing the same question to you, Mr. Singh. Uh, Mr. Your Excellency, it's an honor to talk here on behalf of Brics Institute based in New Delhi. This is the first time that uh, Brics and SU delegates are attending the St. Petersburg International Cultural Forum. Now, coming back to the question, I just want to follow one. This is a very tough question for me, Minister, because I come from India, the largest country now, and also a huge you know, load of history. How do we see history? The, the colonial history, the imperial history, and there are many versions of history. So we are still lost in defining the history. History for the victors, history for the grassroots people who are working in the farms. Whose history? Is it European history, English history? or there could be some local history also. So still internet is not capable to grasp the language. There are so many languages our people speak. Just like in Russia, you have so many nationalities. And their history, we, we don't know much. My last visit to Vladivostok, I came to know some excellent part of Siberian history and their people, the Buryat people, the Buddhist history. And I felt I'm very close to them. But in mainstream, in Google, on, on internet, we don't find much information. So whom should we blame? Should we blame our professors at universities or our museums? Do we have enough museums which can show cause or all nationalities? I'm sure this city is the capital of museums. But still, Russia is such a huge nation that I think we need more museums to show cause the great history of Russian people. And going back to India, we are still struggling how we come to a consensus. The history written about India is mostly the professors who study in Harvard, in Yale, in Cornell. They come back and they use their sources to write the history. So to be precise, I can say in India or in many South Asian countries, we still go to bibliotheca, go to libraries to find our history. But it's very disputed. And as um, chairman, our guest from France said, that we need to create some uh, new consensus on our history, especially the history of World War II. The post-World War II history is, and the Cold War history is so disputed that our young generation they are fed some toxic material in terms of Hollywood movies, video games, and now AI. So I just stop here by concluding that whose history, what kind of history, the history of our culture, our people, our great leaders, our patriotic wars, that's the point. Thank you so much, Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Singh. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your um, assistance to the moderator, uh, because you have already prompting the next question to us. We should st start thinking of that uh, already. And I would like to address my next question to you, Mr. Sakwa. Mr. Singh mentioned the Hollywood films, which are released and, uh, and very often dedicated to history. Well, of course, uh, for as long as we know literature has existed, uh, literature has been addressing 
major um, historic and historical events and issues. But at the same time, there is the science of history, and there is the school curriculum. Um, in your opinion, and on the basis of your experience, what can you say? Where do people draw the information about history, history of nations, history of people, uh, most of the people? Thank you very much for the question. It's fundamentally important. And I'll uh, merge, in fact, the first and the second question, because we're talking about what are the major sources of our knowledge about the past and then the way in which it is presented in the present. Uh, you talked about film. But I actually think that there is a... It, the way that people understand the past is in the context of, if you like, a spirit of the age, a type of sense of the, the common sense of a particular time. And this is then reflected in the films, in the literature, and in the popular culture of a particular epoch. And so today we have a political culture which is highly uh, polarized, highly politicized, and highly partisan. In other words, it's very difficult to get a substantive discussion going on and each side puts forward their own perspectives and in a type of, if you could say, uh, I would even say a type of mythical, mythologized manner. Uh, I used to argue that a myth is a fiction that tells us the facts. Uh, and of course, these myths are reflected in film, in books, popular culture, popular television, and so on, and of course, in the internet. However, I begin to feel uh, that in our times, that it, you know, myth is no longer a fiction that tells us the facts. A myth today is a combination of facts that generates a fiction. In other words, we're living in a world of fictionalized. You could even put it, uh, 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 I'd even go further to say that many of you will know the, the Marvel world, the Marvel comics, which have now become a whole franchise of films. And what we're seeing is the marvelization of the world in which history, events are presented, heroes emerge, actors emerge out of nowhere, no context, no understanding. They suddenly, the, the villain emerges, dark, evil, as a great force, uh, but why, how, in explaining it, and I think this is why history is so fundamentally important, and we need to go beyond the myth and genuinely try to find the facts, and that is, of course, where historians are so important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sakwa. Uh, Mr. Mohammed, my question is to you now where people get their notions of history and information about history. Uh, good morning, Pets. Uh, yes, in my opinion, the people uh, such as United Arab Emirates, we are uh, a young country now, uh, we have taken our sources for the history from our uh, heritage, uh, from our uh, old people in the country, and also trying to uh, uh, register some of them, like doing some uh, film about them and about uh, any attitude that we have had before. But mainly the people in this age uh, going to the internet more than uh, a classical uh, textbook, which uh, we have uh, been before going to the uh, textbook and reading and going to the libraries, uh, uh, studying about uh, any uh, history, about any other country, any other cultures, and how to uh, bring all these cultures and understand the other to uh, reach to understanding each other from uh, the history. Uh, what the beautification of this one, uh, that uh, we can uh, uh, go forward to, to use the social media in this age uh, from internet, but I mean the social media, which is uh, uh, all the tools of the social media we can use uh, to uh, brightness of the history and the culture instead to other uh, uh, people or other country or other uh, particular c culture trying to um, uh, make the history a little bit just to be sight in them and uh, looking to the ugly side of the other countries. Uh, this is we have to be careful about all of these information which is coming to us from uh, uh, 
different uh, parties. Uh, but mainly the, the, the people who get all these from the schools, from the uh, universities, uh, uh, from uh, when they travel also, going to see these museums, uh, from the museum they can take uh, most of the information from there. This is what we done also in the United Arab Emirates. We uh, built and uh, tried to focus on the uh, museums uh, in each Emirates and each uh, uh, part of the Emirates as well. Uh, the Louvre actually in, in, in Abu Dhabi also one of the sources to understand about the culture and how the cultural uh, is uh, having, uh, try, I mean, I mean uh, exchanging of this culture and uh, trying to understand the other culture, trying to understand the other heritage and from that past we can learn for the future. Uh, this is what we have in our uh, country, United Arab Emirates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, um, the Metropolitan, I'm turning the floor over to you now. Please share your opinion on that. So how would you answer that? Thank you very much for this question. Of course, I would second everything that was mentioned before by previous speakers. For me, uh, as, a, uh, as a person of the church, it is very important um, um, uh, to say that among the most important sources for us religious people is religion. Uh, just to give a single example. In all world religions, whether we speak about Christianity, Islam, or Buddhism, uh, or Judaism, there are holy books. These books, for us religious peoples, believers, um, get a moral message, a spiritual message that we rely on. On the other hand, a lot of important fi facts and figures about the history of mankind the civilization and culture are also to be found there. They are very helpful. They help to extend and expand our knowledge of history. History of many different nations has been inspired and very much influenced by religion. We can speak a lot about it, but I would confine myself to a single example. We're here in St. Petersburg, the cultural capital of the country. We are close to our Savior's church on the spilled blood, which is the worship, the house of worship for uh, Russian Orthodox believers. But all people who come to uh, get uh, himself familiarized with this masterpiece, specimen of the um, w international architecture, knows more about the architectural side and also um, get some historical data while communing to this place of worship. So for all of us, it is important to plunge into the knowledge of uh, culture. Religion is always there to help and is of great importance for us. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, comment. And uh, wrapping up our first round, I'd like to turn this floor over to uh, Alexe. Uh, my question is uh, uh, will be a little bit more specific in in your respect. When you came uh, to Russia together with your friends, uh, um, bikers, uh, you visited Moscow, the grave of the unknown soldier, and just you took the part of the eternal flame and you brought it to your homeland, to Slovakia. And you used this eternal flame to lit your candles, and um, and many other people also shared this initiative in many cities and villages of Slovakia. When, uh, on the eve of the Victory Day, the 9th of May, when people would come to get a. a, a a bit of this eternal flame to carry the torch on. How did they learn uh, that that was the, the right thing to do? Uh, were they good students at schools? Did they read the right books? Did they see good films or bad films? 
did, did not have any effect on them, so they uh, failed to distort their notion of history. So how did it happen with these people? Where did they get the historical uh, consciousness, their the notion of, of the importance of preserving the historical memory? Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to tell you uh, how people um, behaved today in Slovakia. In Slovakia, uh, people uh, watch television a lot. Uh, uh, television was uh, monopolized by Americans in, that instilling liberal philosophy they want to destroy and distort the memory of the great patriotic war for the Slovakian um, people's uprising. But Slovakian people um, demonstrated uh, that they do cherish the memory of the heroes of the great war, and they will never forget their uh, heroic deed. Uh, all the heroes are to be thanked for the fact that we are alive today. Uh, television shows that uh, history, not the way it was uh, taught to us at schools by our grandparents, but we need to make an effort to preserve the memories, the true memories of the war and uh, spread the information about those who saved our lives. It is very important for us, our children. Uh, we need to uh, show who and how died for us to live on, and we need to be grateful and uh, loving. Uh, they have a lot of money, but we have one big heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matush. I'm addressing my next question to Mr. Sink. Matush Alexa, who spoke just now, mentioned that there are some forces across the world who seek to divide people who make them collide. And thus, uh, we have some distortions in the historical memory emerging. Would you agree that this is true? Uh, or to what extent maybe it's true? And how we can combat that? Thanks, Your Excellency. Oh. Uh, I totally understand uh, the current debate it's because of the current uh, conflict happening. And so when we talk about history, we have to talk about presence, present also. And uh, countries like India and many countries in BRICS and Global South, they totally uh, decided not to take any side. So this is the very first time that in a conflict like this, most of the countries of United Nations they didn't come out and take a side because they understand that the information flowing right now is one-sided. Many channels have been blocked. Russian information is not going outside Russia. Now, at the same time, they are trying to rewrite the history. They are trying to redefine the, what happened, the new world after World War II, they're trying to imagine this without Russia, which is something uh, for us very funny. If they want to do that, they'll have to shut down their universities. Because in any part of the world, when we talk about the, the war, World War II, I think the sacrifice by the Russian, that Red Army, and also collaboration of uh, Chinese Army and the British Indian Army, is more than 90% of the World War II history. So to just delete the 90% of history and go talk about 5 to 10% of the history is something utopian idea the West is trying to promote. So precisely what uh, Minister Gaspardin 
said that uh, it's the right time that when we talk about culture, we must include our history as part of our cultural curriculum. And this is a challenge for our educationist. So what brother from Slovakia just narrated the story, using the motorcycle race, using the new style, new culture, new train, but getting back to the root, getting back to the sacrifices of our forefathers. It's not easy. The peace, the world, you know, the both word is in Russian is mir, right? Mira. Peace for the world is not something we have got so easily. This story has to be told to our next generation. This is not a world created by Facebook, Google, and, and these IT companies. This is a world created by sacrifices of our heroes in both World War I and World War II. And right now, the situation is very toxic, as our colleague from UK said. But under this, we have to calm down the fire. We don't have to put, make this fire more burning. What's happening in Israel and Palestine region is something we look forward to the wisdom of Russia, India, and like-minded countries to stop the conflict and let us stop the bloodshed and killing. This is only possible by teaching the right history. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Singh. These, uh, the applause is for you and to you for your clear-cut uh, position. Uh, now, we talk about history. We um, talk on how we can learn history in the best possible way, how to preserve knowledge and uh, disseminate it. But the subtext here is the uh, discussion of the future. And you, Mr. Singh, mentioned the uh, uh, conflict potential of the present-day world. So my next question is addressed uh, to Mr. de Gaulle. And uh, uh, here is my question, uh, Monsieur. Uh, in your opinion, this conflict, is this the conflict of civilizations? What is the nature of this conflict? And what can be there um, in the basis of the overcoming of the conflict and the establishment of the long-term sustainable peace um, in the world? Um, cultures of different people, do they have the potential of that? What brings cultures together? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this most important question. In the West, we uh, come across the deconstruction of the major values and traditions. Um, uh, which create the unity. And um, at present, we're trying to um, support and to promote the culture of egoism and uh, consumption. And um, a consumer does not have any need of spirituality. The universal values are lost. And this leads uh, to the impoverishment of the uh, personality. This is what we come across in press all the time, because press is used as an instrument for the promotion of the uniform way of thinking. Uh, um, it's uh, binary logic, uh, just good and bad, black and white. And within this logic, the dialogue is uh, forgotten. The wealth of the nations, the wealth of cultures is forgotten. And what creates our identity is also forgotten. My grandfather used to say that France was built uh, with the help of a sword. There were continuous invasions, wars, but there was also exchange of cultures, commercial exchange, trade exchange. And it's very important to go to those beginnings and to the identity. Because how can we uh, learn uh, history, culture, na the nation? Um, only through proper understanding of uh, these issues. And uh, that is the beginning of the dialogue. 
um, it's necessary to understand how a nation was built, how the nation was forged, and only then we'll be able to have a dialogue. I am often asked a question about Russian culture, and Russian culture is very often discriminated. It is being erased. Uh, its presence in the West is being <coughs> curtailed. All this leads to a um, unilateral uh, viewpoint. Now, we look at the others uh, through our own eyes, through the eyes of a Western person, um, without the understanding of the essence, uh, um, the basics. And this is um, <clears throat> very bad for a common dialogue from the prosperity of people. Allow me to give some examples of this um, historical uh, deconstruction. For example, it was believed that the French uh, did not um, have a, a victory in uh, 1945. They did not win. It, just the Americans were the winners, while France, when France was liberated in 1945, um, um, had um, about one million uh, <coughs> fighters who had been fighting for freedom. Many of them had come from the colonies. So we very often forget about the identity of people, but it's necessary to remember that because people define their life on the basis of their traditions. So in this deconstruction, we can see that history is being um, uh, mangled, and we forget the role of the Russians played during the Second World War. Without this Stalingrad battle, victory would never have been possible. And um, a very important step was taken um, in order to um, win, in order to overcome the Nazi. And in the present day conflicts in, the, in Ukraine and the Palestine, we need to go back to history in order to understand um, uh, people, in order to understand their right to exist and to coexist. And the United Nations uh, should uh, protect the safety and the freedom of nations, but these should happen within the framework of a mutual process. And history is a lesson. Uh, history uh, enriches us. History helps uh, people, peoples and nations to get united for a better world. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sir de Gaulle. I think you covered quite a number of very important meanings in your response. And this will help me to continue the discussion. But um, uh, taking this uh, chance and using my presence here, allow me to respond to your words and say that, of course, uh, the, the French resistance is a, a part of the Russian historical memory. Russian culture, in general, if I remember it correctly, uh, in Russian language, resistance, the word very, the word resistance uh, is a term um, um, uh, coined by Boris Wilder, Russian immigre. And many of the Russian um, prisoners of war um, um, in the, on the territory of France in the um, uh, concentration camps were fighting against the Nazi together with the French uh, partisans. Thank, thank you for reminding that. So my next question is addressed to, to you, Mr. Sakva. Uh, Mr. Uh, well, Monsieur de Gaulle said uh, that um, it's important to know history, to study history. And uh, in the Russian universities, uh, people, well, students, uh, they, they, they are expected to study history. Uh, it's a course um, in all the um, programs, in all the types of curricula, whether you want to be a medical doctor, uh, a linguist, an economist, or an engineer, within one year, you are bound to listen to the course of history and to take an exam. And so here is my question to you. Are we right in that? Is it really important to know history, even if you are not a professional historian? Yes. 
Thank you very much for that. Uh, I've always uh, argued that uh, history uh, is only uh, second only to theology as the foundational subject of the humanities, indeed of humanity. Uh, so obviously we'll put the study of religion number one, uh, but number two, clearly history, because without it, it's a framework for, in which we can understand our times, uh, the past, and indeed, uh, in that framework, begin to formulate a vision of the future. Uh, so, absolutely right. But then, of course, what sort of history? I, I think it should be taught. History is a foundational discipline, and it's important. But what sort of history? I'll just uh, refer, and many of you will know, uh, and obviously in this cultural forum, the great uh, Russian scholar Mikhail Bakhtin, who, who of course uh, was very important, and he talked about dialogism. And uh, this is uh, extremely important that we're talking about, I'm suggesting that in this sort of history of teaching, memory of politics, that it should be dialogical uh, in, in the way that Mikhail Bakhtin, of course, in his studies of the novels of Dostoevsky, would uh, present the, uh, the, the, the actors, the, the people uh, um, in, in his novels, in which uh, the, the actors talk and talk, then they talk a bit more and continue to talk page upon page upon page. But the point Bakhtin was trying to say is that they, at the end of this dialogue, at the end of this discussion, all sides have changed. That it's a dialogical process in which uh, the, a common understanding emerges out of a process of mutual exchange and mutual change. This, of course, doesn't happen anymore at the geopolitical level. It's the dialogue of the deaf. It's not dialogical. And similarly, uh, in history, the danger always is as in international politics, as in any cultural exchange, that it becomes what you know I would say call axiological. That means that we know the truth, and the argument then is simply to tell everybody what it should be. And if you don't agree, as, we've, as some of the other speakers have said, you have this black and white picture, a Manichaean picture, we are good, you are bad, and therefore you have to change. So we need to find by engaging in dialogue, understanding is deepened, and thus empathy is enhanced. Empathy is not the same as sympathy. Empathy is understanding the position of the other. So, yes, I do think that history should be taught, but it should be taught as a genuine sense in which controversial historical moments become not memes, that is just simply given given, I mean, a fact, which, of course, facts are important, but given uncontested assertions, but we have to have a dialogical version of history at all levels, all cultures, and all societies today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sakwa. Allow me to give the, fl uh, to, to, to give the floor now to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mohammed and ask you, so this dialogue, this dialogue that Richard Sakwa mentioned, the dialogue of cultures, um, uh, how effective um, uh, how effectively uh, can it engage the uh, notions of history, uh, remembering that uh, the notion of history is different with different nations. How can we look for something common? How can we build the dialogue uh, for the future so that this dialogue is useful for nations, so that it brings nations together, creating conditions for peaceful development and sustainable development? Thank you very much for uh, this uh, uh, good questions. And uh, I'm... Uh, uh, as uh, in International Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, we look forward through the cultural diplomacy and it's come under three words, what we have used, uh, beautification, attraction, and bridging. Through the beautification of ideas, through the beautification of uh, culture, we can uh, attract uh, the other culture to what we have about the beautification, uh, the history, and the culture has a lot of beautification here. And uh, from this beautification, we can attract others to go for dialogue and build 
the bridges between the nations, between the cultures, uh, to understand each other. And this comes through the exchange, exchange of values, exchange of culture, exchange of languages, exchange of uh, uh, economic, a lot of things what we share together. And what we have shared, actually, this is beautiful. And when it's beautiful, it's come uh, to attract. And when it's coming to attract, it's going to build the bridge here. And we can uh, directly talk to the mind and the heart of the nations and the people here. Uh, and the, the, the tool of the cultural diplomacy is different type. We can go through the museums, through the arts, through the uh, music, through the sports, through the religious, a lot of things which is we sharing together. Here we can build uh, um, our uh, trust between uh, all these countries and all these nations. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mohammed. You said that this dialogue, this uh, um, uh, fact that we address the hearts of people. Now, what you are saying is uh, very similar to what Metropolitan Antonius has been uh, saying. So my question is to you now. Uh, No, so are the Russian spiritual culture, uh, or the Orthodox uh, spiritual culture, mostly. As you said, uh, Russia is a multinational country, multi-ethnic country, multi-confessional country, and Russia is a home for the representatives of very different religions, uh, traditional religions. No. Could you share with us your opinion uh, about the importance of the Russian spiritual culture in the past, uh, in our country, at present, and in the future? So, in a couple of words, what can you say about spiritual culture? and how the spiritual culture has turned into the foundation for Russia, for the Russian civilization. Welcome. Thank you very much for that question. It is not easy to give a, a simple and brief answer because you've touched upon a very complex and uh, difficult topic. But to be brief, I can say that our culture is affected, of course, and influenced by the orthodox uh, religion so that affected our statehood and our language and many other spheres of our life. But the uniqueness of our spiritual culture specific to Russia is its multi-confessionalism. We are a country where representatives of different religions live side by side. And we have a great experience of living together in peace and mutual understanding. We have unique examples of how in our cities and towns and villages, living side by side in the one street, uh, a mosque and a Russian Orthodox Church, Muslims and Russians, uh, go to each other's places and celebrate each other's religious holidays. We have mechanisms of interconfessional dialogues, not only at the grassroots level, like I said, but at the top level. We have an interconfessional council of Russia, which celebrated 25th anniversary. This is a council where representatives of all traditional confessions of our country get together when necessary to discuss important things in the framework of the roundtable discussion, discuss all the relevant and topical issues for everyone. And the participant, I'm a participant in this dialogue. And I can assure you that um, not for one moment did we have any conflict or we, were, uh, we failed uh, to reach a consensus, an agreement, a common point, despite the fact that we are all different and represent different confessions. We have a lot in common, many topics that we can discuss together and um, uh, answer as one voice 
facing the challenges of today. Um, I uh, deal with um, uh, international relations and activities, and I travel a lot. And uh, there are countries, as we all know, that are ridden, conflict ridden, and they are um, uh, imported ones, especially if the con uh, religious component is fueled there. And the experience of living in peace and mutual understanding that we have accumulated over hundreds of years can serve as a good model, as a good example uh, that could be built upon to promote peace and mutual understanding across the world. I think that this experience is of great interest for our brothers and sisters abroad. So when I visit other countries of the world and tell how we live here together in peace, and um, agreement, uh, it does produce um, a lot of interest, cause a lot of interest. This harmony and synergy is what is behind this um, model of uh, harmony, mutual understanding, and peaceful coexistence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, the, the Metropolitan. So this unique experience of Russia uh, is what we're focusing on today at our United Cultures Forum, which brought together over 50 different delegations across the world. And we cherish this experience of ours, and we are ready to share it with other people. And I think that such an approach is not the one that is taken in other countries, in the United States and some other countries, uh, some of the monuments of their countrymen, people who uh, created their own history, are dismantled. And they are accusing them of colonialism and other sins. So the same nations. Uh, are engaging in neo-colonial practices. This is exactly what it is called. And I'm asking you the next questions, Mr. De Gaulle. In your opinion, such a behavior, can it be uh, described as a kind of a repentance uh, uh, meant to distract the attention of the whole world and the uh, nation of uh, and your own nation from what is happening today. I think that uh, a free person is a, a person of action and person of interaction with others. I always remember Socrates: "Know yourself, and you will know the world and uh, God." There are three major questions that the person is asking himself. Who are we? Where are we coming from? Where are we going to? You need to go back to the origins, uh, to the origins of our history and our culture in order to uh, interact and understand other people in this multipolar world. You need to know better the culture of other nations. It's only through uh, this that we can un understand each other better. There is a sub American subculture that seeks to uh, deconstruct the major values and creates the um, inside out culture uh, where the collective consciousness is abandoned and where we lose the understanding of uh, another, of the mankind on the whole. American and Anglo Saxon world is functioning within the uh, logic of uh, blocks or simplifications. You're either part of this block or you are expelled and discriminated against. So this American subculture, lamentably, uh, is seeking to contract and annihilate, destroy the culture and uh, the national heritage of the nations. Uh, by driving out any idea of identity, trying to simplify everything. Uh, this is um, uh, everything is being 
cut off, the person is deprived of uh, his ability to think and uh, he uh, falls an easy prey to manipulation. They're acting through manipulation in market textbook, marketing textbook. Uh, it all comes f from the 1950s, 1960s. The whole notion of manipulation comes from there. But we need uh, to be conscious, uh, conscious of ourselves to be free. Uh, so there are many different trends in this multipolar world. And you mentioned this. Modern conflicts are civilizational conflicts. On the one hand, we have Anglo-Saxon world that seeks to discriminate uh, against this consciousness, the uh, ability to think critically, uh, to get rid of faith and family as non-concepts, promoting other values. On the other hand, there is a multipolar world uh, that seeks to maintain its traditions. So uh, uh, hence the uh, modern conflicts are conflicts of civilizations. Russia, China, African countries and Latin American countries, for example, are the ones that want to um, develop using a free model, respecting their cultures and traditions, respecting each other and listening to each other. and they. Uh, try to maintain spirituality outside which uh, human cannot exist. This is what brings nations together. Uh, uh, this, the knowledge of your own culture, of your own history, and respect to uh, the spirituality and religion of others are important notions. Thank you very much. Mr. De Gaulle for these very important words. I'm calling upon Mr. Sink. Uh, uh, dear Mr. Sink, you are head of the BRICS Institute. And these values, the principles of, of a multipolar world that Mr. de Gaulle mentioned, uh, respect for other cultures, for other traditions, and other worldviews, respect to the law of any of, of the right of any country to find your own way for development. This is what underlines uh, the, the BRICS ideology, and this is what is attracting other nations to BRICS. The BRICS is about to extend uh, by um, uh, inviting six more countries to be the members totaling 11 countries. On the other hand, we see the attempts of other countries to exploit other nations and other countries through um, seizing intellectual and natural resources. In your opinion, uh, what about the sustainable and stable future of the mankind? Could these principles and values that uh, lie, uh, underlie BRICS uh, association, could they be promoted basing on the foundation of culture, of true and reliable knowledge of uh, history and uh, national histories of other countries and ma ma humankind in general? Special, Mr. Gasparin. Uh, it's a his topic. Uh, for me to explain because the leaders of BRICS, uh, the original five countries, they have made it very clear that the BRICS is not exactly going to, you know, destroy the current structure of the world. We are here to complement it. And this morning in my uh, Gastonista hotel, when I opened the news, the headlines on all the Russian channel canal is about the Chinese president summit with the American president. Why I want to quote this summit here is that just now Mr. de Gaulle mentioned that the philosophy of Samuel Huntington that our civilization must clash is not accepted in India, China and Russia. So we are open to dialogue and the visit of Chinese president to San Francisco is in masses that we want dialogue. Uh, we are not into conflict and 
confrontation. This is exactly the philosophy of BRICS. The founding five members, I mean the four members, later South Africa. The basic one line consensus of BRICS is we don't interfere in your politics. Our leaders have said m several times that we are not going to follow the American style of you know, promoting or changing the regimes. I'm so excited I can see some colleagues from Afghanistan and Taliban here, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, we need to promote dialogue. And one of the very famous social media picture I see is a Taliban soldier studying in a library, reading books. So reading is so important, and it has to be promoted in different part of the world. Not the way Americans have been doing, is picking some students from different part of the world, training them in America, and then controlling their country. And look what they have given us. They've given us, you know, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and I can go on. And again, when we go to any US uh, bibliotheca or library, they themselves have a history of 300 years, but 90 to 95% of the books are about American and European history. But those countries and nations and civilizations, which have history of more than 5,000 years, okay, China, India, Russia, Africa, they can just finish the whole history in one book selves. Or even to their lectures in the classrooms, they'll just finish this section in just two, three lectures of their one semester. So this kind of biased teaching about historiography, about our cultural memories, the way we perceive our past has to be stopped. And this is only possible under the framework of BRICS. BRICS is an excellent platform for cultural cooperation, for writing our history with our own scholars. And I'm sure Russia is the first country, even China, is promoting the creation of new muse museums in different countries. There are some countries who want to learn from the experience of Russia, India, and China. And that experience is not only in art and culture, it's also in our material culture, in our museums, in our libraries. So, uh, Mr. Precisely, what I want to say is that option is very clear. What kind of world we want? Do we want a multipolar, multicultural world, or we just want an English world where some group of people decide our history? I totally thank the government of France for respecting the contribution of Indian soldiers in World War II. The French president invited Prime Minister Modi and dedicated a very special part to the memories of Indian soldiers who sacrificed and fought in different wars in European satellite. Definitely, we want other countries to follow this. And this trend started from Russia. When Russian government on Victory Day, on 9th May, they invite uh, Chinese soldiers, Indian soldiers, and different countries to come and take part in the celebration victory parade at the Red Square. So this is an example, and here in, today in this forum, you, we are, why we are saying united culture? If we can unite the culture, we definitely can unite the people. And today, at this, I really want to uh, congratulate the organizations of, this, uh, organizations of this forum, especially Minister Constantine, that we have got some religious leaders, some think tanks, some politicians, and professors, and of course, enthusiasts. So this kind of dialogue is very necessary. We cannot just let politicians decide our future. We need to have dialogue with religious leaders from different religions. And in India, still, the, just like Russia, the status of temple, the guru, uh, is very high. And if they say this is right, correct history, that is mostly taken by Indian people as correct history. So I'm very happy and congratulate the forum organizers for selecting such a diverse panelist and I stop here. Thank you, Minister. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Because you called us upon um, uh, visiting libraries. 
um, uh, um, historical education is so important for us. Yes, thank you very much for mentioning so many important things for us. But continuing the discussion, allow me to address uh, Mr. Mohammed. And um, uh, here is my question to you, and I will address the same question to the other participants of our discussion. So, but the question to you first. So you said that you, uh, United um, Arab Emirates are quite young as a state, but at the same time, the nations are uh, ancient, so with very rich culture, history. And so um, there is an impression that those who uh, created the country, those who define uh, its present and its future, um, um, we're, we're very good history students and learned a lot of lessons. Would you agree with me when I say that? And uh, do you think uh, humanity is able of learning uh, lessons, history lessons? Do we have any hope of that and any prospect of that? Yeah, yes, uh, the United is a uh, young country and uh, the founder of the United Arab Emirates, they have believed before from that uh, who do not have the past, do not have the future. This is the word from uh, Sheikh Zayed, the founder of the United Arab Emirates was. And uh, from this uh, word, they have tried to learn from the past and to build for the future. And what we see in United Arab Emirates, how we are shaping the future and how we are going forward to look for the future, uh, having the lesson from the past and going forward for the future, not looking for the what we have, but we learning from what we have had before. Uh, in the United Arab Emirates, through the uh, uh, these values of uh, tolerance, uh, peaceful, and uh, protecting the right, which is uh, uh, everyone have uh, a right there and has been protected by the law. Uh, the people who are living in United Arab Emirates, more than 200 uh, nationality, but all of them, they are uh, together there. Uh, if each one is respecting each other, everyone is working together. Uh, all of them in the one country, like a one home. Uh, in United Arab Emirates also, uh, I, I uh, gave the example actually about the UAE, how they live, the Dubai Fountain. Dubai Fountain, there is a very beautiful music and the dance between the water and the music. And in, during the new year, it will be the dance between the water, light and fire. All of these dancing together in a very beautiful way by the beautiful music and all the people from all the nation, they are uh, uh, enjoying there and all of them, they are uh, respecting each other. Uh, all of them, they are happy from different culture, different religious, different uh, countries. All of them, they are together and enjoying what the beautification that they are seeing and the uh, uh, all the differences, they are together. Uh, the UAE has also uh, experience uh, how to, uh, I mean, this is the great experience from the United Arab Emirates, who, how to brought all these people together and to manage uh, all this culture, all these, uh, I, I, I mean, the um, religious, all these uh, uh, languages, all these uh, people who have from different countries to live each other and understand each other through the uh, uh, exchanging of the, what they have. Uh, our leaders, they celebrate uh, the uh, New Year for the Christian, they uh, celebrate the Diwali for the, in the, for the Hindu there, they uh, celebrate the Nowruz. They celebrate all of these, uh, not just with the people, but also our leaders, because they believe about what the other values, other people, what they have, and they respect, and each one who has to be there to respect others as well. Uh, I think uh, from this uh, experience, uh, we did a lot of uh, 
beautification uh, of uh, the culture there and uh, all of the people they have uh, understood each other and I think this is the ideal uh, idea for the other country through the uh, what I say is a dialogue, uh, tolerance, and uh, the uh, peaceful to promote between the people, and just going to be going to other nations as well. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. In your words, I heard sort of restrained optimism. Anyway, it is based on real life. You emphasized that creators, the founders of the United Arab uh, Emirates uh, paid a lot of attention to the analysis of history, of historical experience. And uh, allow me to address the same question to Matush uh, Alexa. Now, the situation in the world is quite difficult and complex and difficult. The same is true for your country. Do you think humanity is, is able of uh, learning historical lessons and make use of these lessons for the future? You know, uh, uh, no. here today, uh, there is a lot of people. Yeah. No, we do not have problems, uh, but we uh, have people who uh, want to thank history, remember history, and respect each other. We respect each other as human beings, as human beings with good heart. But today, in the European Union, there is a serious problem. Uh, political problem. Uh, 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 people uh, within the union respect money instead of respecting each other. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, they um, display a certain trend towards forgetting history, and they want nations to forget their history. But uh, people who respect each other um, as uh, uh, we who meet here and respect each other, uh, Serbia, China, India, Russia. No, we're all here. We're all together in this world. We're all brothers respecting each other, respecting what we're doing. So, uh, but uh, our work is most important for everyone, for all those who um, respect. So we need to work as brothers. We need to work shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow. And it's um, uh, extremely important for everyone in all countries. Uh, do not even know how to express all of that. But um, in the European Union, um, the politicians think just of money. I keep saying that uh, there is nothing good in that, that um, it's much more important to respect each other, respect us as we are. Uh, I do not uh, respect uh, 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 the person because he is uh, Serbian or Chinese or Indian. No, I respect them because they're human beings and because these are human beings with a good heart. Um, but the person who does not have a good heart is not a friend of mine. Um, a person who is thinking just of money is not a friend of ours. Uh, um, we are all standing for truth, and that is the route that we need to choose. Uh, your president uh, said recently that uh, truth is uh, strength, and we're all together strong. If we are together, if we 
take this route towards truth. And if we do that, that means we'll be very strong as BRICS, as all of us. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Matush. Thank you. And uh, my next question will go to Mr. Sakwa. Uh, uh, professor, you mentioned today Bakhtin. And uh, uh, allow me to mention Vasily Kluchevsky, an outstanding Russian historian, who used to say that history does not teach anything, that history just um, punishes severely uh, for uh, lessons that have not been learned. So history is not a teacher, but a rather uh, an overseer. So you said that on the basis of empathy, on the basis of this empathic attitude to each other, on the basis of uh, a professional attitude to history, it is possible to try to understand each other, to understand uh, other cultures and uh, other processes that uh, find root in the past and uh, take place in the present and define the future. Do you think humanity is capable of learning history? Uh, learning historical lessons, or this is something not even to be discussed. Thank you. Uh, I, can we learn from history? Uh, yes. Do we get the right lessons? Usually, no. Uh, if you you know the famous uh, philosopher George Santayana, who said that they those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. But, uh, and then, of course, you'd say, well, what lessons are you going to draw on? Mark Twain also had a very fine statement about history. It doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So, in a sense, each time history goes in a spiral, similar patterns, similar issues emerge. What, uh, the, the question today then becomes, what lessons can we draw from history, and what are the most pertinent questions uh, facing us today? And obviously, uh, we need to then sort of try to get a sense, what is the historical moment we're living in at the moment? How can we define this time, this time, this conjuncture? As we know in that uh, summit meeting with uh, Xi Jinping, the president of China, and Putin earlier this year in March, uh, when uh, Xi Jinping said that we're living in times the like of which we have not seen in 100 years. So it's a fundamental change is taking place. People often use the image of tectonic plates. But ultimately, the worst thing is that we have repeated history. We did not learn from history. And what I mean by that, we had a first Cold War between 1945 and 1989. And in 1989 to 91, uh, the Soviet Union, Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, Reagan, Mrs. Thatcher, Francois Mitterrand, and uh, Helmut Kohl, and many others, all participated and in the belief that we were overcoming not just the specific Cold War of that time, but that we would be able to overcome the logic of Cold War. And what is a Cold War? A Cold War is when you have an image of an enemy, and the point about a Cold War isn't just you, had, you have an enmity towards or put an adversary, but that this adversary is considered existential, that the very substance, the enemy is not just a, an abstract military force, A versus B, but that the other one is absolutely substantively, tragically, catastrophically, philosophically mistaken, and therefore this other adversary uh, has to be destroyed, otherwise he or it will destroy us. That is the logic of Cold War. That is the logic of Cold War which is now repeated. That is why we are now in a second Cold War, in which the various conflicts which we see in the world are just like those conflicts in the first Cold War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War today, the Ukraine War, and then the, uh, even Palestine. So we have do, we are doomed to repeat it, a tragic cycle, and this is the tragedy of our times, that we have failed to learn those lessons. And so, can we learn? Must we learn? Yes, and doubly yes, but have we done so? Absolutely not, and we are simply repeating a tragedy. The worst thing is, of course, today, is that this second Cold War is far deeper, far more entrenched, far more bitter 
far more dangerous than the first one. So, uh, yes, history is fundamentally important. I actually do believe that one way or another, by studying the past, how we overcame that logic of conflict in the first Cold War, we can begin to think about how we can get out from this terrible time now in which we're trapped once again in a second Cold War. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Sakwa. Uh, you still give the humanity a chance, and I think this is a very important allowance to make. I think you said very right things. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, we still have some more, uh, some 10 minutes more to go till the end of the session. Time does fly, and thank you for this very exciting and interesting discussion. We are going to um, drift towards the finale, and I would like to ask all the panelists one question in conclusion, and please be brief. Uh, but very specific while answering it. Today we're talking about history, about historical experiences, about how we can understand history better through culture, through art. Uh, this interest in the past, I would term it as nostalgic interest, as a nostalgia. I think it is ubiquitous across the world. You can find it in many different spheres, uh, in advertising, in our everyday life, in uh, artworks that are emerging now. This nostalgia, this view into the past, doesn't it signal the deficit of faith in the future for the mankind? We are all um, we all want this faith to, to, stay, to still be, to linger on, to rely on for the humanity. So the way to um, reinstall the faith into future, uh, is this way through culture, do you think? I'm asking this question uh, to you, Mr. Mohammed, first. Um, yes, actually, uh, I'm go I, I'll go through the word from uh, His Highness Sheikh Sultan, Sheikh Dr. Sultan bin Mohammed Al Qasmi, when he says we build uh, museums for our uh, children uh, to understand about the history, heritage, and the past, and to shape the future. Uh, in my uh, ex experience, actually, I see, I see uh, we could understand from the past and from the history that what we have learning, but we have also be, uh, we have to be, be careful about what's coming to us from the uh, social media and uh, some other uh, uh, aspect like such as the movies, uh, films, uh, which is also bringing to us and uh, attracting the people for something which is not right actually from the history what have been uh, written. Uh, for example, we have seen a lot of uh, uh, movies talking about uh, the history of the Middle East, and that history uh, uh, was not the right history which they have promoted, but the people understood from that movie more than reading and understanding what they have had before. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Matush, I'm addressing the same question to you. Uh, regaining faith, into faith for the f uh, in the future, does this way lie through culture, in your opinion? I'll be very brief in answering this question, but I'll tell one important thing. The victory will be ours. I would uh, say that this is uh, the archi important cultural archetype. Uh, these words have been cutting through the last 80 years of our culture. Thank you, uh, Matush, um, that you um, 
uh, got this important national archetype together with the Russian language. Um, Metropolitan Antoni, this question is very serious indeed, and it deserves a separate discussion. Yet, uh, faith and uh, faith of the fu in, in relation to the future and spiritual culture. Does uh, the future rely on a dialogue about faith and understanding? Does it have a good potential for the future? So that the mankind could look into future and would follow the way of peaceful and sustainable development for a, a believer there is always room for faith in the bright future. But uh, I would like to uh, reformulate a question um, uh, uh, that you meant um, to be answered by uh, the previous speakers, to speak about the confidence in the future. Without knowing your past, you can't be confident of any future, the development of any society, the historical evolution that this nation is making is a um, a path of achievements, and the achievements, um, some of them were quite costly and erroneous, and you need to understand the reasons uh, for making these mistakes, not to repeat them in the future. And at the same time, knowledge of the past allows us um, uh, uh, pre-anticipate um, this future, pre-plan it, uh, uh, f fighting for the future is an important factor for the, of the political processes currently on. And some um, forces are trying to reformat uh, these processes and introduce the rules of their own making. We see it on the Ukrainian example. They are rewriting national history to do everything to sever the ties between the brotherly nations. And an important factor of providing for the spiritual unity and understanding uh, the Russian Orthodox Church is prosecuted and persecuted, and the bishops are jailed and clergymen are jailed, the uh, churches are devastated and ceased when the memory of the past is erased and destroyed. This hard disk is reformatted, and you can write whatever you please on it, writing the future. Uh, the way you find fit, not the way that the nation wants it to be written, but some Muppeteers who want to control and guide uh, this future. And um, uh, it is uh, important to be confident in uh, that we are having the future of uh, the making that people want it to be happy, harmonious, and bright, so hence my answer to this question of yours. Yes, it is important to remember about the past in order to be able to have hope for the bright future indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sink. The, the same question is addressed to you. Mr. Gaspardin, I thought uh, I'll be the last one. I'm looking forward to our leader from France to enlighten us. But since you ask me, so my brief answer is here. Uh, th to conclude this dialogue today, uh, all of you are here. Thank you so much. But what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that what's the problem? The problem is our friends from Europe, they come out with something called nation state. And now they themselves forget that they have European Union, they have common defense policy, they have common euro currency. They have so many things in common. When we are talking about Eurasian Union, when we are talking about BRICS currency, BRICS Union, they are not comfortable with that. So they want us to follow them in democracy, in human rights, in different nation state building, in constitutions, in rule of law, in respect for the individual rights, LGBT. But when we try to implicate what actually they are doing, not they are talking, they are very uncomfortable. So today, with permission of our moderator, I just want to conclude that I look forward to the speech from Mr. De Gaulle, 
that France is the only country which believes in introspection of history and uh, reapproachment to the dialogue with different civilizations. And we look forward for a multipolar equal world where some countries shouldn't think they are empires, we are just nations. And that's why they can make a movie like Oppenheimer, they can make fun of Bhagavad Gita from India. We are not a movie material. Today, I like the topic United Cultures because we need to be united and tell the other side that our cultures must be respected, our traditions must be respected, and our people will decide what kind of civilization and government and economic system we want to be. China did it, Russia have done it, India is on the way, and my colleagues from UAE, Africa, they have to do it. So the future of the world lies in the self-respect and respect for each other. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, thank you very much. My question now to uh, Mr. Sakwa. Yes, you're welcome. I mean, the question you began with, the issue of nostalgia, looking backwards, absolutely. I think that is uh, one of the uh, features of the present moment, is that we've lost a sense of the future. I remember when I was young, we looked forward to the future, the building of hydroelectric dams, the building of high-speed railways, of nuclear power, all of this is not just technological, but also medical and other developments. And the astonishing thing is, is that even though the world has the potential today to really create these utopias of which we dreamed of in the past, we've lost it. So when you asked, is it through art that we can achieve that? Yes, of course, art is fundamentally important. But the questions uh, are always framed through politics. So I'd say what we need to do today is to regain a sense that politics can make changes for the better. And this is ultimately what has been stolen from the people today, is the sense not just of the future, there's no future because we can't organize for the future. Popular movements, uh, or, uh, a protest isn't enough. We need organized movements for a positive peace agenda, peace and development to allow that potential which we have within societies today and all of the uh, emotional energy which we have, we've heard on this panel and in the audience uh, we have today. It's, it's being dissipated, it's not organized, it's not directed towards uh, overcoming the logic of conflict and establishing framework and for that we need to go back to the foundational principles of the UN Charter of 1945, that whole system and that moment of 1945 when we felt we've, over, we've had ended one war that we can start developing in 1989 in the first Cold War, let's now move to this positive peace. We still have that on the agenda and we need to war work towards that vision of a positive future. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. Now, uh, my question is to Monsieur de Gaulle. Just in a couple of words, will you please round up our discussion? Uh, what is the pathway into the future for humanity? How is it possible to rebuild our belief into the future? Can it be associated with culture? Should it be in the... Culture. Allow me to quote my grandfather, Charles de Gaulle, who used to say, since everything begins uh, again and again, the most important thing is to support and develop life. In this phrase, there is a lot of humanism, but there is also a proper understanding of history there, of the uninterrupted vector of life and responsibility. In it, there is also the idea of democracy, how much time was needed to establish stable democracy in the world, in France, in Europe, 13 centuries since the fall of the Roman Empire. 
uh, people are born uh, free and equal in rights, but we forget the other part. The differences between people should be based just on the social usefulness. In uh, West, there is certain a certain distortion. Uh, uh, they believe very often that democracy, these are just rights, but it's also necessary to uh, rely on the notion of duty. Uh, we have the duty of knowledge, of transfer of this knowledge to our people. Uh, education is fundamentally important. We should never forget the notion of duty. But then there is one other thing, uh, spirituality. And the first um, uh, message of the prophets is uh, learn and uh, teach others. Transfer of uh, knowledge is the main function of the humanity. Oh, th uh, thank you very much. Thank you, dear friends, dear participants of our discussion today. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers and the audience. It seems to me that we uh, were able to touch upon very important issues, and your words were significant, were very important for all of us. This question this issue of the role of culture and the possibility of uh, learning the past, the present, and the future through culture is asked by many. And uh, we should try to understand if it is, it should be done, if there is any prospect in that. But uh, the representatives of different countries of the world, different continents, have been able today to answer this question. Just coming here to St. Petersburg and taking part in the forum, they give the answer. They take part in the forum of United Culture. I wish all of you most interesting, successful work at the forum. I would like to thank once again all the participants of the discussion. Thank you.